Hi, everyone. Mm. I'm Gordon Brickell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. Uh, you can subscribe at filmmakeru.com. Every Friday, we have a talk with a film professional to chat and give you a chance to join us and ask questions. Today, I'm joined by Dylan Titchener, uh, editor for Boogie Nights, There Will Be Blood, Brokeback Mountain, and so, so much more. Uh, hi, Dylan. Welcome to the show. Hi, Gordon. Thank you. Um, I, my first question, and I've been dying to ask you this, is do you <laughs> uh -oh. know about the DM project? DM? I guess not. It's D, I think it's D-I-E-M spelled, DM. DM, DM, day, like daily, D day? No, not ringing so, a bell. What is this? It was, um, it was a project. The reason I was bringing it up is there, it was a project where some scientists in the UK uh, designed some technology to track viewers' eyeballs uh -huh, to right. see what their focus is and how they um, basically utilize or under, understand how they can interact with the footage. Uh, and they used There Will Be Blood as their test uh, tool because <laughs> they had enough time during the shots uh <laughs> no i didn't know about it. i mean that technology has been used for years for different things but uh what what came of that uh it was basically it was research to see to understand how cuts or lighting or various things impact people's ability to focus mm. uh, on the film and how it sort of um i guess you know if, if people are getting bored or if they're getting engaged <laughs> Right. Um, and so as you watch it, they've placed the eyeballs, like you can see like little, um, circles. Yeah. And as the circles get bigger, that means someone's focusing on that more. That, that, that their attention has stayed. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, no, well, I, so I'd like to read the, the results of that. Yeah, I can, I can, I'll send them to you. I was, I was wondering if you had seen it cause it was, uh, became very popular among a lot of people that, who saw the sort of demos. Oh no! Yeah. Curious. I mean, I've, you know, back way back <laughs> decades ago, I remember Drivers Ed used a tech like that to show us where pe where drivers' eyes were looking on the road. And then recently, you know, I ride a motorcycle, and on the racetrack, they do that too to to train sort of race racers. Yeah. Um, movies i'm super interested there was that i'm gonna get you all sidetracked but there was something i'm remembering that there's a there's a sort of scan pattern that uh i i don't remember who discovered or hypothesized about this but a a pattern that 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 they say your eye uses to scan a screen when a new image comes up and i my memory is it's sort of middle lower left upper right you know it sort of does a big loop around the screen and i, I have thought of that from time to time when cutting <laughs> i think you'll find this interesting then because it's uh it's interesting to watch because I, I think i've seen the same driver's ed sure. video that you're talking sure about it's, yeah it's a, um, it was a 16 millimeter film man <laughs> but yeah <laughs> but um what's interesting is similar to that because if i remember correctly people's eyes are subtly doing little adjustments to mm -hmm. pick mm -hmm. up information and it's the same thing when you watch the film they're just mm -hmm. sort of adjusting and then a character will speak and everyone sort of jumps over and see what that person's sort doing. of fun yeah. yeah um so i guess one of one of my questions for you then is um you've worked with a lot of uh well-established directors and directors who've um sort of put out some of the top films in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, mm. How, when you're approaching a project, what is your, what is your approach to uh, your interviews with the directors and getting to know them uh, <laughs> and getting the work? One director once said, geez, that was like you were interviewing me. <laughs> um, it, it is sort of that. I mean, I, I want to, um, you know, the things that are super important to me are um, script, director, actors, DP. The, uh, those are kind of the top things um, for me because uh, those are the elements that I work with most directly and that I think are, are, are the biggest contributors to the, the actual bricks that we'll use to build it. Um, I want to know the director's point of view 
I want to, um, you know, usually I have thoughts on the script, not necessarily quote unquote notes, but sort of thoughts or questions or uh, what's the intent of this or is this, you know, those kind of things. And based on that discussion, I get a good idea of, um, yeah, how I think it's going to go and the kind of brain that's behind the decision making that I'm going to have to work with for a year. Um so I don't know if I have an approach. I read the script usually twice. I do write notes. Um, and sometimes we don't get into notes, but I want to know how the filmmaker is thinking about the project. Um, you know, sometimes notes aren't, you know, I certainly have read a couple scripts where it didn't really have notes. Um, but uh I guess that's my approach. I'm not sure if that's answering your question or what the real, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have an approach. Um, I just am eager to meet people who yeah. I admire. I mean, I've worked with a bunch of first timers and second timers and stuff like that as well. Um, so it, there's sort of a, a balance. Uh, Do you I don't change? know. Because I've, yeah. I've met editors who really like to work with first-time directors. Um, <laughs> Why is that? I, it's a Canadian editor that uh, lives here in Toronto with me. Um, and no, but I mean, why Why is that? Oh, no. why is that? The, he yeah. works in, in documentaries. Mm -hmm. And so he really likes it because he can work. There's less of a, uh, I'm established. This is how it's done. Yep. It's more like, let's figure out the story. Yep, uh, and go through this footage, and so he finds that they're more because they're usually nervous too with the docs because they're like, "Do I have anything?" <laughs> right, right. Um, so right. yeah. So, uh, uh, no, I, I get that point of view. Uh, there's just in, from my perspective, there's trade offs. There's a lot that you learn as a third and fourth time filmmaker as a director. I think that the first couple times out. Um, you know, I've met some first timers that come or, you know, not necessarily first timers, but second timers or something that that they come to it with a pretty with a theory. You know, they have theories about how films work or how this project works. Um, and that doesn't always land. You know, that doesn't always stick. And um, so I, I've seen it the other way, too, where. Uh, you can really go the long way around the barn to find the movie because a filmmaker is sort of stuck in their original um, assessment or original view of the project. Uh, uh, but I, but I get what your friend is saying too, as well. Yeah. It's interesting. What are some of the, like, is there a theory that you heard and you're like, I don't know about that. And then it turned out to be accurate or, well, I don't know. I used to get in arguments with Night Shyamalan, and this probably not arguments, friendly arguments, but this <laughs> this uh, this probably relates to your Diem project thing um, with the eye tracking. You know his theory, and you can sort of tell in the movie I did with him, uh, Unbreakable, is you know every time I cut, the audience has to reset their whole thinking process. Mm -hmm. Now I personally don't think that's true and I didn't think it was true then if you make a bad cut if you make a um jarring cut yeah you are going to do that but I I think two things I think one um some of the best cutting that we do in cinema is mimicking what the brain itself does uh when you turn your head really fast you're not panning across the room your brain is sort of shutting down and then opening up again when you land on something that you want to focus on um, when you're in a, if there's a three-way conversation and you're in the middle, your brain isn't going now, I will sweep across the room to the other person who's talking, or I'll tilt up to the mirror so I can see the other side of the room. That's not how humans do communication. We are very used to sort of paying attention to this, paying attention to that. Um, so I think cutting when properly sort of meted out it can be quite seamless. Um, Knight had a theory, you know, he tried to do a lot of oneers, and I've worked with a lot of directors who were into oneers at various times in their career. And a lot of it is super successful and makes really compelling cinema. 
Um, but also it's very challenging to work with pace. It's very challenging to, um, you know, you can think you understand where the focus of the storytelling should be when you're on the set, but often, very often in post that changes and you, and, and you realize, well, I thought that this scene was about this or was only about this, but truthfully, it's also about this, or now we need it to be about this other thing. And the footage that I collected really locks me in to this one idea. Um, and that, I think he probably learned a lot of lessons about that. Um, I think I was trying to be very open and to his, you know, theory. And over the years, um, I still think about it, whether, uh, things can be done in one or, and I, I sort of, um, you know, I'm an advisor at Sundance and things like that. Um, and a lot of filmmakers ask me about one Um, I don't know that, that, that's what came to mind that long answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's interesting because I think about one all the time too, cause I get asked about them. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was, and not to like keep going to like the scientists, but um, there was a scientist in California. <laughs> we in like Boston. scientists in America yeah. too. Don't worry, Gordon. <laughs> Some of us like scientists down here. Um, but he he um, scanned the brain as people were watching cuts. Right. And like a like functional MRI. Yeah, like had something mm -hmm. on their head so they could see how the brains were reacting. Right. And what he found um, was <clears throat> that change. Uh, so I can't remember the exact thing and because it's been a while since I've read it, but a certain amount of change excites the brain. Yeah. Absolutely. And so if you're doing a one or there has to be enough activity in it. That's what I, the brain yeah. gets bored and wants something else and moves on. Well, that combines a couple of things that I, that I talk about when I, when I try to help people and uh, that a one or should be really, um, a series of setups that you're figured out graceful way to move between so that this part is this idea, this part is that idea, uh, always giving more information when, when, uh, and editing in general, I think is, is always about new information when the audience gets lulled into a rhythm or a set of stimulus stimuli, uh, that, that can be the advantage that you have because then giving them something new, snaps them out of it thought of that quite a lot in there will be blood um you know I, I think those are fundamental aspects of sort of watching visual media how do we do that then with slow paced films <laughs> because i think about there will be blood and it's one of the like i love that film in the sense of like it i can i it's a long film. It doesn't feel long to me, but it's slow paced, but it's, so, you're so engaged with it. So how do we. Well, a, a big part of that's Paul Anderson uh, making sure that when he makes a shot, it's fantastically engrossing. Mm -hmm. um, and then another part of it is, um, you know, I, the, I, I just very much kept in mind trying to vary the pace, even though it, it's, fairly uniformly slow. Mm -hmm. uh, that isn't to say that I didn't have sections where I deliberately went faster or almost uh, some stuff I almost was jarring with because that's the effect that we wanted. Um, I, it's just about how many ideas there are to think about. And if you're out of ideas, you know, if the ideas have dried up on the screen, it's time to go to something else. Mm -hmm. um, but ideas can come from a lot of different places. And Paul is really very good at making a sort of roving camera discover new things. Um, even if it's very simple shots, uh, he just has a good sense about it. Um, he's good with blocking the actors in addition to blocking the camera. Mm -hmm. And that uh, is very important and often what filmmakers um, can overlook is that it's not just about set all your actors up and then wander the camera around amongst them. You can also very much move the actors to work for the camera so that the movement and the, and the motion of ideas uh, and the kineticism feels uh, twice as much um, even if the camera's not moving because of what the actors are doing. 
uh, and you know, you can you can get into a thing. It's a, it's a delicate balance as a director to have to ask your actors to do something for the camera that's sort of technical and risk taking them out of their heads. But if you're, you know, if you study um, the, the sort of great and most effective single shot things, uh, it'll give you a bunch of ideas on how to block. Um, so I, for blood, I don't, all I can say is that uh, I really just try, I tried to, um, I myself as an audience member, because that is sort of my job is to be the first audience member. And um, I just wanted to entrance myself. Um, there's a lot of beautiful music and scenery in there that is also used to tell story. Um, and so I just sort of leaned into that. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say it. You know, it movies sort of, I did another film called uh, Assassination of Jesse James that is also very methodical, methodical, yeah, patient. Yeah. Um, and it was the same thing. I, I let the movie tell me what it wanted to be because Warner Brothers on that movie certainly wanted it to be a much faster movie, but it didn't want to be that. It would have been a bad movie. You know, it, it wanted to be that, which is how Andrew, Dominic, the director, you know, thought of it and, and did it. But also that's what the material was was saying, the, the performances and the um, sort of the cinema of it wouldn't have resonated if I was constantly working against it, you know, um, and as an editor, just on a political note, it. It can be very not only nerve wracking, but scary to sort of try to stick to your guns, as it were, about what you think um, the style of a project should be or what, what a movie should be when there's a lot of pressure to make it into something else mm -hmm. that, you know, in, in, in these cases that I can think of for me, those movies didn't want to be the something else. Um, and I think in, in a lot of cases, fortunately, it, you know, time has sort of proven that that idea valid in that people have really responded to some of these movies. Um, yeah, they didn't make a zillion dollars, but that, that's not what they were going to do. So, you know, there's other movies that make a zillion dollars. Um, now, you've worked with Paul Thomas Anderson since Boogie Nights. Mm hmm. Before, how, well, before Boogie Nights, how would you say your career and or how would you say your relationship and how you guys work together has changed over the time? Oh man, well a lot. You know, we've we've been friends for twenty five years. I've been on some movies and not on other movies for uh, scheduling reasons, various reasons. Um, I think Paul, we've both grown as filmmakers. Paul has certainly grown as a filmmaker. His I think his approach to filmmaking is quite different than it was in the early days. He was very, um, the word you use was methodical. Um, and, uh, hyper prepared. Um, and the more comfortable he got with filmmaking, the less, um, scholastic he got about it. And he, uh, was was more comfortable just having a basic idea what he wanted to do and finding great actors and great locations and then feeling it out as he went um and that you know that's working for him uh i think i've learned a lot from all the people i've worked with and all the projects i've worked on you know i learn stuff on every movie um which is why i try to do a lot of different projects I'm just interested in different things. Um, and so I think, you know, from the beginning, Paul was pretty open with me about talking about the, the projects and, 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 and being a sounding board for him in terms of script ideas. Um, and that's been a really fruitful and rewarding experience to, to just you know, love film with him. That that's really what it felt like because we both really came to the movies with a with a serious uh, adoration 
and a lot of it was were similar things. Um, I'm trying to think how else things change. You know, for me, I I think I've just gaining a lot of skills and experience and um, on on all sides, on sort of the technical side, on the <clears throat> purely sort of creative, you know, in the beginning, I can remember or I can I can know now when I'm working on something, making a cut, choosing a bit of film, uh, deciding how to put something together. I can feel that, oh, this is something that would have taken me two days when I was first starting out because I, I was figuring it out. What's the most effective way? How, what does this do? Now, a, a lot of things are much more facile to me and I sort of understand this is going to produce this effect. This is going to, you know, do this. And I feel it. And often, not often, but sometimes my, my head jumps back and I remember, gosh, I remember doing a cut like this on Boogie Nights and really slaving over it. And now I know that the trick is to leave much earlier than I was leaving and, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I think a lot of ways um, we've both grown um and paul is really you know sort of finding his own you know he's got his own voice his own his own style that that he he works in um and i really enjoy working with him on the projects that we managed to get together on well, you you mentioned that you've gone to different <clears throat> types of films uh you know like right now you're on eternals uh yeah. marvel um, how would you say from an editing perspective or what are the challenges of working on a big project like Eternals versus something that's more um, methodical and what have you, like There Will Be Blood or uh, one of those films? Uh, well, you know, there are specific challenges to this movie that I probably won't super get into yeah, right now. Obviously, yeah. um, but the you know, th there's a great thing about much bigger movies, and that is that you have all of the resources that you need at your disposal. If there is a way to tell a story, if there is a, a beat that you need to put into a sequence, it is very likely that you can get it done. Um, so the the creative storytelling um, for editors kind of it, it moves into a different realm when you're on movies this size. A little bit because it's not just about the stuff that was shot in the camera and what can I make it do it's also well there's a lot of other images and and shots that I can think of that if I need them somebody's going to make it so um that's uh fun to play with um I love science fiction um I have really adored the Marvel um approach to filmmaking you know, I haven't loved them all, but many of them I've really enjoyed and, and have gone back to many times. And uh, to be frank, been um, surprised at how well um, Kevin, uh, Lou Victoria, the people at Marvel have done um, the approach to comic book movies because I've managed to feel a lot and been told very, not only very entertaining stories, but also really interesting stories. And certainly the, the longer the, they go, the more, um, you know, human uh, experience they're teasing out of their comic book movies. Um, and arguably, uh, you know, it's the cutting edge of cinema in a lot of ways. And I know Marty Scorsese, whom I love and have lots of respect for, sees it differently. But I think, uh, you know, I appreciate his movies tremendously. And I also appreciate MCU movies. Um, they can coexist. I, I think they're both uh, part of cinema. And so I, 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 I enjoy working in this big sandbox. A, the people are all so um, enjoyable and super professional. And B, it's great fun to tell bigger stories, you know, larger than life kind of stuff. Um, and like I said, every movie comes with its own challenges. And this one 
is is not an exception. So lots of things to deal with, but you do have many, many tools to to work with. So it's fun. You talk about challenges. Is there a scene in your career that you you was you know extremely challenging for you, but you look back and you're you're proud of the work and why was it? I'm sure Gordon, I just <laughs> I'm not sure how I would ever think of that. Uh I, um yeah. <laughs> we I, i'd love to talk about it we just have to sort of narrow down somewhere because i have such a hard time i'm not really good at going oh there was this one time at band camp when i was <laughs> trying to do this I, I just don't think that way mm-hmm. but i do remember it all and feel about it i'm just not i have a hard time calling it to mind that way um uh i could sit here and go um off ah, for five minutes but i i'll see <laughs> I, I don't know I mean, if you have a scene in mind where you're like, this seems a little problematic, we could talk about that. That's easy for me to do. I just, I don't, I don't easily call things to mind. I mean, you know, there are sequences that were very challenging, like Mm -hmm. Zero Dark Thirty, uh, a couple sequences were challenging because of the material, um, meaning the shots that I had, not that they weren't good, but that um to build a sequence out of the kind of stuff that I had sometimes was challenging there there were sequences of um kind of nebulous things uh, almost documentary approach really where it was and that was Catherine's the director's approach to the movie was quite documentarian you know Mm -hmm. she did three and four cameras for most scenes simultaneously and just sort of shot what was happening um, and tried to do it as real as possible. So the footage that I got, about 300 hours of it, w- was, um, you know, just here's what happened, tell the story. And um, <clears throat> so stuff like tracking the courier, you know, mm-hmm. this whole sequence where you, you track a guy across a couple uh, countries and... Um, I just had miles upon miles of footage and then some scenes that I ended up voicing over that footage and stuff like that. But pulling that together <clears throat> took uh, a long time um, and was challenging. Yeah. And then other things, I mean, that movie was challenging in other ways. Other, other, other things were challenging, like cutting the interrogation scenes, challenging for a totally different reason, just emotionally draining um, I would work on it for a little while and then go back to it the next day, work on something else because, you know, it's pretty intense. The actors were great, especially uh, Reza. I forget his last name, but the guy who played the detainee in the beginning of the movie, just a great performance. Um, it just felt very real. And, and he, he gave a lot of interesting things that w- w- I was able to use to um, make it much less predictable and one-sided it was much more interesting mainly because of what he did not necessarily what he said but what the actor brought to it with his face and his behavior and what you know so therefore the the bits I was able to work with Um, and that's always what I'm looking for so it's challenging like climbing a mountain is challenging Mm -hmm. Um, it's a it's a thing that you set out to do and every movie to a certain degree feels like climbing a mountain some mountains are higher than others. <laughs> well, I have to say, I love uh, the ending shot where she's on the plane. Yeah. You just sort of focus on her. And I thought that was the perfect shot to end on. Great. Well, that was always the ending of the movie. Um, we did talk about doing it differently. But the truth is, uh, what's what, what, what I think is kind of great about that movie is it's a very procedural thing and we're Mm -hmm. focused on this woman that just Chastain plays. Um, And it is very clear. It becomes more and more clear that that is all she does. And she says it to Jim Gandolfini, you know, that I've done nothing else. This is all I do is work on Osama bin Laden. Um, And it becomes increasingly clear that that's all we see her do. Mm -hmm. Um, And by the end of the movie, now that the job is done, she has no idea who she is or where she wants to go. Yeah. And that was that scene. And uh, yeah, it, it worked for me 
you know, when when they shot it and and I cut it, but it really worked going back to the movie after I hadn't seen it for a few years. Yeah. And I went, wow, that that really I get it. I get it. She puts it together. There's a couple <clears throat> like in the Hurt Locker when mm-hmm. the guy gets like he gets sent back to the US and he's just standing in the grocery store. Like what yeah. are that again, Yeah, that's a great scene. I love that scene. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now I have one last question I like to ask everyone I interview. Yeah. Now we've been in this COVID <laughs> time for what are you talking uh, about? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, now a lot of people have been streaming stuff. So is there a show or a movie that you streamed during this time that you're like, everyone's got to check this out? <laughs> oh man. Um, I I have no surprising or like uh <laughs> and so you know i've done things like i've run the gamut i've watched old doctor who that i love and grew up on the tom baker doctor who and that it, it's always a go-to for me and i i watched every one of his episodes during covid <laughs> um which is a lot but it's not that much maybe it's yeah. five years uh but it was great to do it in order i did that um hyper nerdy and you know, I really enjoyed uh, WandaVision. I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying, I enjoyed The Dark. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I don't know. What else have I watched? Uh, I, I do watch a lot. I honestly, I tend to watch movies mm-hmm. um, more than series. Is, is, is. Uh, <laughs> that said, um, I don't know. I'm getting the director I'm working with, Chloe Chow, asked me to do lists of, um, you know, what are the top 10 sci-fi, top 10 Westerns, top 10, you know, this and that. So I've made those lists for her. And in doing that, I was really uh, sort of like, oh, I'm going to go back and watch all these myself. <laughs> I would um, see those lists too, but. Oh, uh, they're pretty, uh, not too many surprises on them. Yeah. Certainly now, back in the day, there was a probably like I've been a fan of the original Wicker Man for years and years and years. Um, but I don't think too many people talked about it or knew about it until some people made a bad remake of it. Yeah. Now, are you because you like sci fi? Are you I do. Have you, have you read uh, Ted Chang's work? He does short stories. Uh, I, it's not ringing a bell, but tell the, me uh, his. Is there a title or? Yeah, his short story um, called "Story of Your Life" was turned hmm. into Arrival by Denis Villeneuve. Oh no, yeah, no, I haven't, yeah. I haven't read that. Should I? I guess well, so. I, if you liked Arrival, they're all sort of that. Yeah, I liked of, Arrival. Mm-hmm. That type of sort of philosophical questions raised through sci-fi. Right, love, love it. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for letting us interview. Oh, Gordon, thanks for doing it. I appreciate it. I hope, uh, hope I didn't talk you out of some questions no 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 we, I, I go you just turn on and i go <laughs> well if you want i can send you to the dm project stuff yeah please do that yeah, yeah. i got unfocused focus because <laughs> um, you'll, you'll find it interesting i think yeah please send me a link to that love that thank you awesome well thanks so much my pleasure thanks for having me gordon